management uh, excites me. I've built my entire life around it, and I, I can see the value of it. So when, uh, when Sunil Prashar rolled out this idea of the project economy uh, last year in Philadelphia at the Global Congress, uh, I got fired up about that because I think, in my view, after 54 years of working in the business, here's, here's my view. Uh, everything is a project and everybody is a project manager. And so when I look at what he defines as the project economy and he calls the projects the engine that drives the economy, uh, if I take it and take out all the fancy words, it gets down to everything's a project and everybody's a project manager. So what I wanted to try to do is to, to decide what's the relevance of this concept of strategic linkage. And I, I mean, it's so important to organizations, uh, if they want to be successful, they have to do strategic planning and they have to execute based on that. But the, the issue also becomes is, well, is that important to a project manager? Uh, does a project manager re really care about strategic linkage? So I'm going to try to cover both sides of that spectrum today. Uh, thus far, I, I made this offer to do these webinars for any chapter in, in the world. We've got 301 chapters, any chapter in the world to make a request. We ended up with about 57 chapters. And so far, up till now, I've presented this webinar for about 5,000 PMI members. So you're among a, a pretty good-sized crowd. Feedback's been pretty good, but uh, it, you'll decide about the feedback and, and so, sort of based on your questions, I'll understand pretty quickly uh, how well we did. So keep in mind, if I, if I don't cover what you want to talk about, if I don't touch on why you joined this webinar, we're going to have a shot at the end to, to pick up on those questions. I, I'll tell you in advance so you don't get shy about it. Uh, Singapore, when I did Singapore, they literally had 97 questions. So we ended up going a little overtime on the, on the Singapore program. Okay, let's take a look at this first slide. If you look at what, what I'm trying to say here is there is there needs to be a linkage. Sometimes we are calling this a strategic alignment. I, it, the terminology doesn't bother me. It's just the fact that what we do in project world has to be supportive of and consistent with what the organization wants to accomplish. So I'm going to talk to you in that terms. I'm going to use two uh, two companies that I work for. You'll recognize the names of these companies. Uh, one is General Electric Company, uh, one of the more successful organizations in the United States over the years. Uh, the other one is IBM. I, uh, two very specific examples of the importance of strategic alignment with projects being executed for those two organizations. So I, I figure if it's, if it's good enough for GE and IBM, then by golly, it's good enough for me. Next slide, please. So what I want to talk about first is I want to be sure we understand that one of the key elements of strategic alignment is to make sure that, I mean, I'm going to say this facetiously, make sure that the projects are aligned with the strategy. In other words, I don't want to be doing a bunch of projects that aren't contributing to the success of the organization. And when the, when the organization goes away and does strategic plans on an annual basis, and in the old days when I was young, uh, they used to plan three-year and five-year plans, and uh, now we're lucky if next month we can plan in any kind of detail. But the fact of the matter is, organizations spend time thinking about, where do I want to go in the next year, say? Okay, what, what, what do I want to become in the next year? So they go away, and the C-level, CIO, CEO, COO, all the C-people, go away and have meetings and have... Uh, discussions about what do we want to accomplish. So they're establishing high level strategic objectives. You know, it may be to increase revenue, it may be to reduce costs, it may be to introduce new products, which has some relevance to both of the other ones. And so they start to name what the strategic objectives are. And then out of that comes business objectives. What business things do we have to accomplish to support the strategic objective? And then finally it gets down to you, uh, the project manager. We're the, we're the last uh, we're the last tier. 
Uh, so when it comes down to us, we, we should know that that project that we've been assigned, that that project charter that we were given has support of a strategic objective somewhere up the chain of the organization. Well, the reason I show this slide is that one of the key elements and benefits of project management is that we have an opportunity to status progress and then we can compare that progress on the project with the required progress to support the strategic objective. So obviously, whenever there's a disconnect, we, we have to take some kind of an action or get some kind of a decision that allows us to continue in the way that we are. Well, the beauty of now is we had, back in the old days, back, I started in 1966. Now, now I know some of you, uh, weren't even born in 1966, so I'm a little embarrassed about that. But in 1966, all we had available to us was the predictive model, the the very basic model that, that most of us of, of any age at all have, have kind of grown up with. We, you get a project, you have a start, you have a finish, you plan everything that needs to be done in between to get from there to there, and that becomes your project plan. You get a project team assigned to you. Uh, so that they stay with you in the entire time and you can manage that project from start to finish. That's the predictive model. Now, there's really not a, a true predictive model uh, remaining now because of the matrix. We don't, we, we, get, we get a project, we get our, our, our charter in and we know what the project uh, essentially looks like but when it comes to staffing the project, when it comes to getting the resources required to do the project, we end up having to beg, borrow, and steal from resource pools who manage how those resources get allocated. So we don't get a dedicated team that stays with us from the start. We get people that are in and out based on what the needs of the project are at that time. Well, this makes it even more critical to have better understanding of when we need what skill set when. So the predictive model has modified itself based on the, the resource pool or the matrix approach to project management, okay? Now, next came the idea that, you know, we're, the, the, the IT projects that we do, they don't seem to fall into that predictive model. We don't, we don't have all the information that we'd like to have from start to finish, uh, but yet we still start working on those projects as if we knew what the end product looked like. Well, we started to recognize that we could run these in a waterfall model that, that's really sort of a mirror image of predictive with a little more flexibility in terms of changing scope. But then in 2001, in, the, in a ski resort in the hills of Utah, Snowbird, Utah, uh, a group of uh, about, about 20 well-known, world-known uh, programmers got together and produced uh, the Agile Manifesto. So that's changed the world of how we manage our projects now but it's got some very positive benefits that we, we need to understand relative to the idea of strategy. If, if, we, if we're gonna stay uh, aligned with strategy on our projects, our projects have to be consistent with producing what supports the strategic objective. So the beauty of this agile approach is that we have much shorter periods of time that we analyze what we've gotten done uh, what problems we've encountered, and then we roll that into the next sequence. So it's an elaborative scope development process that we, we don't know what the end product looks like. We know what the functionality might be, uh, but we roll through that in this agile approach. So in, in agile, uh, you know, we, we have two, two, two week scrums. We have, we, we have sprints, we have stand up meetings. We have all these variable opportunities to validate that what we're doing uh, appears to be consistent with the strategic objectives. So that's what we've got to be aware of. You've got to, not only do you have to be a project manager, but you have to understand the project and the, the, the system or the methodology that you're using to execute that project. 
So that's the thing that we want to be sure we are aware of, because no matter which style you're using, no matter which methodology you're using, you're heading into the PM universe and you got to know what you're doing with those with those particular activities. Just keep in mind that it's there's there's a lot of projects out there and a lot of people managing them in a lot of different ways so the consistency the the common bond is the strategic objective no matter how you're doing it are are you doing it in order to support the strategic objective so it's important that we understand that and recognize how that all works together next slide please so here's what we're talking about uh if you don't if you don't know what strategy is <laughs> well if you don't know what strategy is you're probably in the wrong business uh, because strategy is a key component of uh, of the idea of project management and so and, and based on what i talked about earlier with the models the the PMBOK has tried to evolve into a current document relative to what's going on in the real world uh, and uh, and so the new PMBOK that'll be issued around the first of the year, first of 21, is gonna change dramatically from what we have now. Our, our PMBOK right now is 90 to 95% predictive model. So everything's built around the idea of a predictive model. But the new PMBOK, uh, when it comes out in January, is going to be about 50% agile, or hybrid and 50% predictive. So we're not doing away with predictive. Don't you know the sky is not falling. I I get questions all the time from project managers who don't manage IT projects. They manage the, what some people call the other kind of projects, uh, and they ask me all the time, "Is yeah, is Agile going to just take over and everything's going to be Agile?" The answer is probably no. I mean, I'm not a soothsayer. I don't know for sure. But I don't think Agile is going to work out very well on building construction, on road construction, on production. Uh, I, I don't think there may be pieces of it. That's why we call the use the term hybrid. But generally speaking, we're going to be managing those projects in the same way we've managed them for years. All of them, all of them though, are tied together <clears throat> with this concept of strategy. And this is what the organization tries to develop early on. What are we going to accomplish in the next year to establish strategic objectives? So the strategic objectives are developed by high-level management, C-level, uh, maybe uh, senior vice presidents, high-level people, not, not you and me mostly, but high-level people. And they set those strategies out and then, and then what's happening now, you're gonna see where projects come from. Uh, people don't, sometimes people don't understand, you get a project charter, you think some guy just sitting in his office made that up. No, that project charter is a roll down, a ripple down from the strategic objectives. When you get a project charter, and this is missing from the project charter document, and I've yelled about this for years and nobody seems to listen, which is not unusual. Uh, but the fact of the matter is when I get a project charter, one of the things I want to see is what strategic objective is this project supporting? I, I need to know that. Now, uh, I'll, I'll explain some of the reasons a little bit later, but I need to know that. What strategic objective is my project supporting? Because that tells me a lot of things. Uh, and, and generally speaking, uh, you you have a you have a strategic objective, and then that strategic objective is broken down into uh, uh, business objectives. So we've got a certain business objectives we need to accomplish. When we accomplish all those, then the strategic objective has been uh, accomplished as well. Well, what spawns projects? Where do projects come from? Now, haven't you ever had your your little son or daughter come to you and say, "Mom and Dad, where do projects come from?" <laughs> If you have, you, that is sick. Uh, kids, don't, well, although now after I see what is being done by the Education Foundation, we're starting them real young these days. But the fact of the matter is, we as project people must have the answer to that question. What strategic objective, what business objective does my particular project support? 
So we should demand that that be. If it's here's here's what you do. This is just a this is a method I've used over the years. It's paid off big time. Uh, if I got a project charter and there was no reference to strategic objective or business objective on that project charter, which there never was, I go back to the person who initiated the project and I start asking questions. And I keep asking questions until he or she tells me to stop asking questions. Now I know I'm on to something because I need to know where we fit. Now, there's a, I'll t let me tell you the reasons right now. First of all, if we're in a matrix environment where there's a resource pool owner who manages that resource, let's just use engineering as an example. He or she is responsible for the management of that resource pool. And in that pool are people with high levels of experience that maybe subject matter experts, they're intermediate level, there's entry level, all, all sort of skill set capabilities within that particular resource pool. Now, when you look at your project, and you realize as you start to plan your project before you've allocated resources, you plan the project, you see where you need certain kinds of resources and you found a place, for example, where you know you're gonna need a subject matter expert for three weeks. A piece of work in your project is gonna require a subject matter expert for three weeks, okay? So you know that and you planned it. Uh, now, here's the problem. Now you've got to go to the resource pool owner and secure that subject matter expert for your project during those three weeks. Sounds easy when you say it fast, but you, any of you that work in a matrix know it ain't that easy. So we look at that and we say, okay, well, I need subject matter expert for three weeks. Well, guess what? There's seven other projects that need that same level of resource skill set on their project at the same time. So now you've, you've got a problem because if you don't get the subject matter expert, it's gonna impact your schedule, could impact the quality. Uh, and so now you've got a problem. <clears throat> So what we need to do is we need to negotiate with the resource pool owner. Now, what better negotiating strength do you have than to be able to say, listen, Mr. Resource Pool Owner, I don't know if you're aware or not, but my project is, is the number one priority project in the organization for accomplishing next year's strategic objectives. I mean, I just didn't know if you were aware of that. So now what I've just said is if you don't give me the resource and I tell the people that you didn't give me the resource and that strategic objective slips, guess who's holding the bag? Now that sounds, I'm, I'm using commonality terms, but the fact of the matter is it gives you leverage. It, give, it empowers you to have an impact on the, <clears throat> on the allocation of resources on your particular project. Every project has a priority. Every project has a priority. And so we need to understand that. So next slide, please. So what you've got to do, you have to understand that you have a responsibility here. You, you can't just accept the project charge, say, oh, I'm, oh gosh, this is, man, this is not, I can't get, this is going to be hard. No, get over it. Face the facts. You need to understand where your project fits. What's the relative importance? What kind of skill sets are you going to, you need to understand that. But unfortunately, today's project manager, we're so focused on delivering that project that we overlook the fact that I can deliver a project, but if it doesn't support a strategic objective, you know what we've done? We've wasted resources. We should only be spending our resources on those projects that make significant contribution to achievement of business objectives or strategic objectives for the organization. So you can't just stick your head in the sand and hope it goes away, because when you pull your head out, <laughs> it's still gonna be there. So we wanna make sure we understand that. All right, give me next, the next slide. So what we have to do, is we have to do a little bit of work ourselves. This, this, this job, if, if, 
if this job was fun, they wouldn't call it work. We have to figure out when our bosses give us projects, they think all of them are priority one because each one of them to them, it is priority one. They, they, theirs, theirs is priority one. Okay, well, the problem is you can't have multiple priority ones. So we've got to look above the individual project sponsors and look at the organizational strategic objectives to seek where does this really fit? Because you can't have, if you've got five different functional organizations, you can't have five project priority ones. There has to be some relative order that will, that will allow decision-making to be made based on the contribution, not on how fast it gets done or how many, how cheap it is when you get it done. It's on the contribution to the organizational strategic objective. So this is one of the places I wanted to tell you a little bit about General Electric. Now it's a heck of a good company. I worked for them for 11 years. I started my project management career with General Electric. So I would never say anything bad about them. I think they're a great, great organization. Uh, and uh, But I learned pretty early that they still had work to do, just like everybody else. And so uh, I was towards the end of my 11 years there. And I, I think they already knew I was getting ready to move on to some more challenging work. And so they asked me if I would review their annual business plan for the next year. Now, during that time, I learned that... Uh, GE, any, any project that was an important project that contributed to the strategic objectives was called mission critical. Mission critical project, okay? So they said, would you mind reviewing our annual plan? Uh, we've identified our mission critical projects and see if, we, if you feel like we've given enough scope definition, we've, we've given enough information that if I give it to a project manager, they'd be able to work with it uh, on their own. Now remember, there's no, this is in 1973, okay? But there's no PMBOK, that was 96 before that came out. There's no... PMPs, that was 84 before that came out. So we're dealing with whatever GE had created and said, would you look at this and tell us how, how are we doing? So I said, you know, sure, I'm, I'm leaving next week, but I'll be glad to do that. So I took a look at it and I read it down and I, I was impressed. It, I thought they had done a pretty good job on, on scope definition, at least enough that I understood what the project was. And they'd taken a little crack at resource requirements and, and time to, to complete. So I looked through the 25, sure enough, 25 of them in, in uh, sequence order. And, uh, but then I, I got down and I got thinking, well, wait, there's something missing here. I said, what about your uh, prioritization? I said, What's, what are the priorities? I, I'm, I'm assuming the one through 25 are the priorities uh, in that same order. And they said, no, 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 priorities are on page two. <clears throat> so I turned over to page two and sure enough, priorities were there. Project number one was priority one. Project number two was priority one. Project number three was priority one and so forth through 25. And I, and I just shook my head. I, I just shook my head. And I said, come on, guys. You, you can't have 25 priority ones. You need to fix it. You need to, you need to be able to know when push comes to some, when resource constraints come to the surface, you got to understand which project do I want to support? Which project am I going to yield to? We're well, going to yield to the highest priority project. I know you want to get them all done, but the fact of the matter is, in GE's case, they had 25 projects. We ended up drawing a line at the end of 17. At the end of 17 were all the resources we had. We couldn't support any more project work at that time. So we had to prioritize what those were. So they said, okay, let us take a, a shot at it and see if we can uh, make you happy. So I came back in about three days and they said, take a look now. And I looked and sure enough, they'd, I know they had changed something uh, I know they had uh, changed the order because it was, I remembered that it wasn't the same. So that was encouraging. I felt, okay, good. They've, they, they've got the concept. So I said, a oh, page two for, yeah, page two. So I turned over to page two and boy, was I surprised. It, it said project number one was priority one and project number two uh, was priority one A. 
And project number three was one, they hadn't done a darn thing. So you need to understand, I, this, I, I'm going to share a secret with you. One of the things that drove my career, and I, I had a very rapid rise career, was being able to identify the important things. Taking, moving away from the minutia to focus on the important things. Well, the important things are what take priority. The important things are those things that drive the organization's success. You can, you can create all the minutia you want, but if it's not driving the project uh, to, to contribute to the strategic objectives, you're just going to be a, a successful PM in terms of getting some stuff done. But you've got to recognize now that you see more and more of this now where we've gone to a little bit different structure where we now have, uh, we've tried to be a little bit more specific and we've formed portfolios. So the difference with portfolios is it narrows the, the number of things you have to deal with from an objective standpoint. Instead of all the projects in the organization, now you can begin to focus some attention on just those projects that support a specific objective that we're trying to accomplish. So the, the process is the same. It gives you the same information, but it's much more focused on what it is we have to do. So uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's something that we've seen growing over the last few years. PMI saw it coming. They have a portfolio uh, certification. So that they, they realize we're gonna deal with that in that way. So uh, I think it's a great idea, the fact that we can focus things in, in topic areas, in areas that support the organization. I think it's important that we do that, okay? All right, so that's the idea behind it. Now, if you don't, if you don't have that prioritization, you don't understand, you have no leverage. Uh, you, you, you can't go to uh, someone in a higher position and point out that based on what's going on right now, we're gonna be six weeks late and six week, week late causes us to miss the strategic objective that's been defined in the business plan. Well, I got to tell you, you're going to get some attention. You're, you're going to get some focus. Now, maybe the focus is get out of my office and get her done. But, but realistically speaking, the focus is because as soon as you say that to the decision maker, they're going to say something like this. Well, what's it going to take to get that thing done? Well, that's what you've been waiting for. Now you tell them. Well, it's going to take three subject matter experts. It's going to take another uh, facility capability. It's going to be, and so you begin to lay out what it's going to take to deliver the business objectives that we're trying to accomplish. So that's that's the idea behind it. If you don't have, this is the other piece that I'd like to be able to get on the on the on the project charter is. What priority is this on a relative scale? Now, the problem with that, of course, is priorities change, uh, business focus changes. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, if, if you don't if you don't know what the project priority is, you need to start asking those questions. You need to find out because the the less you know about the priority, the more likely it is you won't meet the objective. That, I mean, that's just the honest truth. So find out what the priority of the project is and then act accordingly. Okay, next slide. So what we're trying to do, uh, you know, and I can talk about the, the, the high level strategy and the, the strategic objectives. But the fact of the matter is we don't get to play in that game. I mean, I don't know, maybe have any of you ever been involved in the, in the development of the actual strategic objectives for the following year in your organizations? I could probably count on one hand the number of people that have. But once we get a project and we're connected, we're, we're connected with that strategy, okay? So what we're trying to do with this idea of project management is, uh, is link everything together. We want to have a linkage that we can look at it from in two ways. Let me tell you the first way, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this later. The first way is the vertical hierarchy. 
I want to be able to look at my project in a vertical context and look at all the work that's being done and be able to identify cause and effect impacts of things going on in that work. So I can decide, is it going to impact the in delivery date? Is it going to impact the quality? Is it going to impact the cost? I want to be able to look at that at, at the level of the working effort that's going on. Okay, uh, that's the vertical hierarchy. And again, I'll tell a lot more about that later. I also want to then be able to identify the horizontal integration. So I got vertical integration, now I want the horizontal. And this is the area that's weak. I want the horizontal integration in that as we begin to execute our projects and utilize resource from resource pools. Now again, if you're, if you're lucky enough to have a dedicated team that they're going to work with you till you're done, God bless you. You're 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 privileged indeed. But for the rest of us that have to use uh, loaned or borrowed resources, uh, we need to be able to have them linked into the process so that we can identify immediately what the impact would be of a resource reallocation decision. Uh, you got to remember that the resource reallocation decisions are generally made uh, due to a shift in prioritization, due to a modification of strategic objectives. So we can't we can't fault the resource pool owner, but that doesn't save me if I've got a problem. But so I want to know. My my view is the earlier I know, the sooner I can fix it. And that's I'm a fixer. That's what you want to be is a fixer. It's never going to go like you planned it. So you want to be a fixer. Get the information as early as possible and fix it. Okay. Well, here's a, here's another example. This one is IBM. You've heard of them, I'm pretty sure. Uh, in 1993. I had a chance to work with IBM. Uh, they were projecting an eight billion, that's a big B, eight billion dollar loss that year, 1993. Uh, now that's a lot of money. That's more than I make in, gosh, two, three years. And so uh, they had to do something. So obviously they jettisoned their CEO a guy named Jack Akers, he, he's gone. And they bring in someone from the credit card and tobacco industries. Okay, never never worked in, in, in an area like IBM where there's a product orientation, uh, retail sales and so on. Uh, and so Lou Gerstner was the guy's name. Lou Gerstner, if you haven't heard of him, if you haven't read about him, you need to because he, the, the end, end result of Lou Gerstner's incorporation into IBM is that he turned the company around and, and turned it back into what it had always been known for, a very, very successful, technologically advanced organization, okay? Uh, been three books, three books written on this IBM turnaround. The best book, uh, in my view, is the book Lou Gerstner wrote, and I encourage you to get it and, and read it. Uh, it's called Who Says Elephants Can't Dance? Obviously, the, the irony is that IBM was as big as an elephant, and he taught him to dance. I mean, I don't, shouldn't have to explain that to you, but here's how he did it. This is the important thing. When he got to IBM, he spent the first, uh, I'm guessing, four weeks or maybe more just wandering around, looking at what IBM was doing, what kind of projects they have in the works, what, when, what was the schedule for delivery for some of those things. He just spent weeks and weeks and weeks getting to know all of the things they were doing, okay? At the end of that four weeks, then he had a little session uh, and he eliminated, uh, well, the right word is canceled. He, he axed, whatever term you want to use, 60% uh, of the projects. His view was this, IBM has lost focus. We are attempting to do too many things for too many people and it's costing too much money, and it, we have no strategic linkage. We're just out there doing projects. So he canceled 60% of them, created a strategic plan, uh, and uh, marched on to, to, to execute the projects that survived. OK? 
okay? All right, so the other thing he did, he did two things. I mean, sure, he did more, way more than two, but he did two things that are relevant to what we're talking about today. The second thing he did was make a pronouncement that at IBM, from this day forward, we will use project management as the thread that holds this organization together. Uh, some of the strongest words I've ever heard. People laughed at him, you know, you're not gonna change IBM, that's not the way we do business. Uh, but he formed the Project Management Center of Excellence, uh, which was basically a PMO, uh, and their job was to to implement project management and make sure that it got implemented and that it was being utilized according to the rules and regulations. And, uh, and that particular PMO, by the way, is still the benchmark for the industry. Their center of excellence is still just outstanding. So they, they, they put that in place and the, and the next thing you know, everybody's connected. They, they've created a link between everybody. And now Lou Gerstner is able to hold, and he did hold monthly meetings and identify, have people create presentations that generated information that showed linkage, showed strategy, showed priority, and, and sort of the, the rest is history. Now it took a year or more to actually accomplish the, the implementation. So I don't wanna make it sound like it's easy, uh, but the key was they had the, the, the hardware and they created the software to implement project management in a way that really hadn't been done before, except in the US uh, military environment. So very, very successful. Now, one of the things I just cite as an example, he decided, now this, I laughed at this at the time, but I, I was training all these IBM people to become PMPs. I mean, I created the PMP, so they thought that'd be the right guy to do it. So I was training them. But during that time, he made the pronouncement that IBM is no longer going to be in the computer business, in the in the portable computer business. Their, their computer called the ThinkPad was sort of the leader in the industry at the time. And he made the pronouncement that the ThinkPad would be going away. Well, he, 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 he just said it didn't fit with where they wanted to go. They didn't see the opportunities out there in terms of strategy. So he sold the ThinkPad to the Chinese. It's now called Lenovo. So you may well have an old IBM uh, ThinkPad, but with a new name called Lenovo. So it's history. Uh, and, and it's all because of, well, all is probably too broad. A lot of it is because of the use of project management from a vertical integration and a horizontal integration perspective. In order to do this, you have to have automation, you have to have, that's why this whole, the timing is perfect because we're in the throes of, of digital transformation and that lends itself to what we're trying to accomplish in terms of integrating all the project information with the strategic information. So I, I, there's lots of them out there. There's plenty of, of products that will let you accomplish this. Uh, so if, if, if it sounds like something you want to do and need to do, then, then you'll probably want to take a look at some of those systems. I've, I've been working a lot with a company called Cora Systems in Dublin, Ireland. I don't sell their products, but I've been looking at it from the usability standpoint. It's a good one. Uh, easy to use, you can create your own dashboards. Uh, so it's a, it's a good one and I would suggest at least have that be one of the ones that you look at to accomplish this integration concept that we're talking about. All right, next slide. So if we're gonna integrate everybody, if we're gonna make sure we're all linked together, then one of the things we have to do as soon as we get the project charter is we have to do a stakeholder study. Now, some of you probably remember uh, uh, that in the fifth edition of the PMBOK, we actually added, for the first time in an awfully long time, added a, a new section called stakeholder 
management. Now, I, I, I don't think it was very uh, well done, very thorough. It's been improved dramatically since. Uh, but the fact of the matter was we recognized, PMI recognized the importance of stakeholder management. It wasn't an ad hoc thing that you did in your spare time. This was critical. And so uh, instead of having it be a piece within the communications piece, they separated it out. Now, so I'm going to give you my, my uh, approach. Uh, I, I'll almost, well, I can't guarantee anything, but I'll, I'll tell you this stuff works, okay? So uh, I have three levels of stakeholders in my plan. Uh, and remember, what I'm trying to do here is identify stakeholders, what their stakes are, and how best to communicate with them. Okay, so that's a that's in product, no problem. So the first level are called uh, control stakeholders, and the control stakeholders are the ones who can literally stop and start your project. They can they they have the authority to either uh, enable you to go or create some reason why you can't control stakeholders now one of those will always be signatory on the on the charter so whoever whoever signs the charter to authorize the project is certainly in that category but there can be others it can be legal there can be uh environmental there can be people uh, other than the actual project people uh, that uh, that can have an impact on your ability to get the project done. There's only a few, and what I want to make sure is I want to identify how do I need to communicate with them, how, uh, what timing, what form, what format, uh, so that they feel comfortable that they have a good grasp of the project. I, I actually had a project canceled uh, by a person I didn't even know knew about the project. And at the end of the day, I found out that he really – he wanted to be involved and wanted to have knowledge about what was going on and when he couldn't get any when he didn't get any he ultimately canceled the project so that's that's how important control stakeholders can be okay all right now next level are the these are the impact or influence stakeholders these are people who can uh, have an impact on or influence the output of uh, project work Okay, now you, you're the project manager, so you're obviously on this group, but everybody who has work assigned is in this group. Everybody who supports people who have work assigned, like resource pool managers, are among this group. And we need to look at it and say, who, who, who do we need to keep up to speed uh, so that their, their people or they themselves can continue to operate in a beneficial way? These are called influence or impact stakeholders, okay? What are their stakes? What's the best way to communicate with them? Now we've got a third level that I'm, I'm actually going to throw in a third company reference here. There's a third level called they're called information stakeholders okay we probably interested they're, let's call them interested stakeholders they've got a, they've got an interest in the project they don't have any direct linkage they don't have any direct input but they're interested now they may be interested because they they anticipate having a project like yours in the future. They have a problem right now that they want to see how you've solved problems. It's like, it's kind of like an, a, a live closeout report. So this, the interested stakeholders uh, are, are just interested in what's going on. They're not going to impact. They can't stop you. They can't impact outcomes, but they can keep up to speed with what's going on. So that's, it's, an infor, it's kind of a one-way flow of information. Uh, in terms of the project, so let me let me give you uh, an example. I'm going to give you this. I always like to use this because I'm going to give you an 11 billion dollar example. 11 billion dollars, verifiable, absolutely accurate. 11 billion dollars. Okay. All right. So in about 1990. I was retained by a company called Behringer Mannheim out of Castleton, Indiana, wholly owned by the Inglehorn family in Mannheim, Germany. Their product was in-home use blood glucose monitoring 
products, in other words, diabetics, for diabetics to manage their blood glucose. They'd been hammered in the market big time with a new product by Johnson and Johnson. And so they brought me on board to execute what later became known as a miracle project. They, they had to get three years worth of work done in 18 months so that they could get into the market with a product equal to or better than Johnson and Johnson's. So I signed up like a fool, uh, thinking, okay, I, I can do this. And so I got to pick the people I wanted out of the functional organization. And uh, one area that was very important because of blood interaction was the, the fact that I had to utilize 25 chemists. So I got line management to allow me to pick 25 chemists out of a group of 100 chemists. And, and we, we had to get the project done with those 25 chemists. Well, it caused some real hard feelings, caused some real problems in that the 75, th those that didn't get picked for this special project were upset, were angry. They, they felt short of, they felt like they should have been part of it. They, they felt like, hey, I've been here 20 years. More. So I, I wanted to get, I wanted to fix that because I can't have, that bad influence having an impact on my team. So I said, look, let's do this. The next four Friday afternoons for two hours, let's get my chemist 25 together with your chemist 75 and let those 100 chemists, no agenda, no fixed output expected, just let them talk and exchange information. So they got together and they looked at what they were doing and what was working and what wasn't working and what might work and just, just just exchange information, okay? So I call them information stakeholders. They exchange information. So by the fourth week, though, my schedule's starting to get, we gotta go. So we had to end those sessions and on with it. Well, to make a very long story short, we worked 14 hours a day, seven days a week for 18 months, and we got it done. We finished the project on time. PMI has written it up in the PEMNET magazine as a miracle project. And so we're so happy, everybody's happy with it, got it done. We saved the company, okay? We saved the $1 billion company. So we went back into the marketplace and holy mackerel, I started gathering market share at a rate. We, no, we were stunned. Nobody could believe how big of a success it was in the marketplace. Well, some people believed it because three years later, three years later, Roche Labs acquired this Inglehorn family owned product for $11 billion, $11 billion. And it's still their highest profit margin product because you gotta do multiple tests a day. Uh, you gotta do them every day. And the rate of diabetes is going on a vertical plane to where we, we're getting so many people with diabetes that the marketplace is essentially unlimited. So uh, I get a, I get a uh, Christmas card from the Inglehorn family uh, every year uh, reminding me that I made them very rich people. So. Had we not, and I didn't ever tell them this, I don't think the Inglehorn still knows unless they're listening today, uh, the chemistry that went to market, and by the way, it's still the winning chemistry. I, I'm diabetic myself and I use my product. That chemistry was not developed by the project chemists. It was developed by the functional organization chemists my guys couldn't get it. They couldn't solve the problem. Well, the functional guys did. Maybe it's because they had more people. I don't know, but they did. And that's what we used. That's what went to market. And that's what ended up in an $11 billion acquisition. So there, there's another example of why interested stakeholders can pay a big dividend. There's other reasons too, but we don't have time to, to go into those in detail. Uh, next slide, please. So once you get the project, you, there's a lot of pressure on you to get her done. Let's see, let's get going with this thing, get started. Well, no, I, I need to plan and no, let's get her done. And, and why can't you get her done? We got tools for you, we gave you tools, what's the problem? 
Well, that is the problem. The problem is this, and I've been watching it long enough to know, the problem is we've become tool happy. We, we, we've forgotten some of the basic concepts of project management, uh, and unfortunately, we, but we've gotten really good at using tools, uh, and so we have to understand that, that we need the basic information. If we're going to drive strategy, if we're going to stay linked with strategy, we've got to use these tools to our best effect, okay? So in my projects, I limit the use of tools really to three tools. There's three tools that I insist my project people must have. First one is a well-developed work breakdown structure. Remember, we, we, we vertically decompose the work down to the working level. We give a rule of thumb of 80 hours or whatever the real number is. We get it down to the working level. Once we're down to the working level, that allows us to assign resources. Once we assign resources, we can determine costs and time. So everything's vertically, hierarchically integrated, okay? Then we look at that information and we say, now what, now what do we do? Well, we start to pick it apart. We can, we can create a cost plan uh, on it, but let's wait and get it time phased. Then we can do a time phased cost plan. So for that, we need a critical path schedule. Uh, the CPM has been around for decades. It was created by the Department of Navy back in the 50s for the Polaris program. Uh, and uh, we, we have lots of different scheduling techniques, but PERT is not a schedule. PERT is risk management. CPM, and I misspoke, CPM was developed by DuPont to do cost trade-off analysis uh, to determine what the benefit of throwing more resource at a project would be. Well, we can do this in our projects. If we're on a project that's significantly critical to the support of a strategic objective and we see our schedule starting to slip, maybe one of the options is to throw more resources at it to gain back the slippage. Well, you need a CPM schedule to be able to do that. You need to be able to identify critical path from float paths. You need to know that the only way to shorten the schedule is to shorten the critical path. You need to know that float paths give you some flexibility because you can move things around as long as you don't exceed the amount of float that you have. So the second tool is a critical path schedule. Now, both of these, when I ask organizations, when I go into consulting, I always have some really basic questions. Do you, uh, are you using project? Oh, yeah, of course we use it. I said, are you using work breakdowns? Sir? Absolutely, that's the key to our whole project. I said, can I take a look at it? They bring me a Microsoft project bar chart schedule. That, that's, their, that's their work breakdown structure. I said, no, that's not. How about CPM? Are you doing that? Yep, we're doing that, and they hold up the same thing. So there, there's some work to be done. We need to, our learning curve is a little bit short in terms of that process, but we need to do, that's two. The third tool is risk management. Uh, if, if we're defined down that low level, if we have a critical path that identifies where the critical elements are, then the fact that we need to do risk management becomes self-evident. And I'm not talking about just a risk register where you identify all the risk. I'm talking about assigning responsibility, tracking the condition of the risk, and so on. Those three things, okay? WBS, critical path, risk management. If you don't have those three, if you're not using those three, there's a pretty good chance you're going to get disconnected from the strategy. Next slide, please. I'm going to spend a couple, I'm not going to spend much time on this next slide uh, because we don't use it much anymore. I don't know how you guys are in uh, Pakistan and, and around Norway. We got people from all over the darn world here. Uh, but, but the waterfall is kind of a, a thing of the past, if you want to think. I mean, people argue, no, no, we still need waterfall. No, we probably don't. Uh, we're probably moving away from it. Where I go, I can't. I, used to do a lot of teaching for the LDS church in Salt Lake City and they did uh, they they actually had two two shops they had a waterfall shop and they had an agile shop uh, and and what I noticed in the waterfall shop is all the people that were in the waterfall shop were old old people uh, and, and they kind of support the theory of you can't teach an old dog new tricks so they're just going to 
keep doing waterfall until it until it, it dies or they die. So waterfall is kind of a thing of the past, but it became uh, a good stepping stone to uh, accomplishing good software management. Okay, next slide, please. So here's a lot of people are are getting involved in big time getting involved in the idea of agile. Now, agile has taken the world by storm. I mean, literally by storm. Sure, the agile manifesto was only issued in 2001, but in the last four or five years, my goodness, uh, the, the number of people switching to or learning how to do agile has been phenomenal. Uh, PMI has a a acquisitions to get agile capabilities within PMI super well received and so people are beginning to see the potential value. Remember the big key, the big difference in agile and predictive is agile is elaborative. It, the, the requirements evolve. So this answers the problem in the, the uh, old methodology in the predictive methodology the biggest bitch i ever heard was that the requirements aren't well defined how, how are we going to give you a detailed schedule and a cost plan and a resource plan when we don't have good clear requirements okay well so agile addresses this by saying we're going to start the project even though we don't have good clear end objectives uh, we're going to start doing it, and as we do it, we'll modify things as we need to uh, so that when we get to the end, we'll know we have something that's usable, okay? Simple, simple. Well, it's having a big impact because now people are starting to ask, should I, uh, should I get a PMP or should I get an uh, AP or should I get a Discipline Agile or should I become a Scrum Master? It's giving you some things to think about. But one of the things you don't need to think about is, is Agile, does it work? It absolutely works. The people that, that use it and use it correctly swear by it. So, but all projects aren't going to require Agile. Remember I said in early going, production, construction, all those kinds of projects will continue to be predicted, okay? I just want to make sure you understand what, the analogy here. This idea of a scrum, uh, came from the the sport of rugby, and in rugby uh, they they throw a ball into the center of the scrum, and then everybody starts pushing and shoving and biting and kicking until the ball squirts out. Somebody picks it up and runs as far as they can before they get tackled. Okay, that's what and uh, that's what rugby does. Well, agile does the same thing, except now this is a little misnomer. It's not the PM's not really the key player here. It's the scrum master. But they throw the requirements in and do that pushing and shoving, squirts out, and then they're on to get on to the next requirement. So they've really uh, taken the analogy of rugby to a new, to a new level, uh, a level that's really uh, working for IT in the IT world. Okay, next slide. Okay, if you look at if you look at this now, if I've if I've done anything to uh, convince you that you don't need to be connected to strategy, uh, that strategic objectives aren't important. If I've done anything that did that, uh, please uh, don't think anything about what I said because that's not what I wanted to say. If you if you incorporated or if you interpreted what I said as a an encouragement for you to run on your own as a project manager, get her done, get her done, uh, and then see what the hell we do with it, uh, that's not what I've been talking about. So if you're convinced, if you get to be a uh, a convert, nothing worse than a convert, by the way, but if you get to be a convert, you're not done. You've got to sell this idea uh, to the strategy guys. Because if, if you don't convince the strategy guys that it's the right thing to do, then they're not going to support it. And so you can talk till you're blue in the face, but until you can convince the strategy guys uh, that it's worth doing, you're going to continue to fight an uphill battle in connecting that strategy with, uh, with your project. You see, strategy people don't want to talk to us uh, low-level people. We're just project managers. Well, they've got to talk to us. We've got to have some interaction, and we need to convince them of that. Okay? All right, last slide, and then we'll take some questions. 
here's the deal. I, I just want to make sure you understand this. You, you got to understand this. Uh, this this actually represents two people I know, two very good uh, project management people that I've known for years. And so over the last couple of years, there's been this uh, emphasis on strategic objective linkage, okay? And I've tried to convince them, I've tried to get them on board in terms of, come on, you, you need to recognize that every project has to be connected to some higher level outcome that we need to achieve. And they said, no, no, the project management is about getting projects done. Uh, and that's what we do, and we do it well. And so that's what they did. They hammered away, hammered away, hammered away, got projects done, uh, and they take them to the strategic people. They say, where does this fit in the strategy? And they say, well, no, this is project number one, two, Z, uh, and we got it done. In fact, we got it done three weeks early. Isn't that awesome? Uh, and the strategic guy says, yeah, that's great. We got this three weeks earlier than we didn't need it in the first place. And so after about two or three of those kinds of projects, these guys, these guys were laid off. They they were they were they could not get on board with the connection to the high level objectives of the organization, and they're now looking for work. I don't want you to be looking for work, so figure it out. I've given you everything you need. You're probably every one of you smarter than I am, and so take what we've talked about today, take what you already knew, I suspect you knew some stuff before you came here today, and put it to work. Create some strategic linking, create some vertical integration, create some horizontal integration, and then you're gonna be satisfied that you're doing everything you can to support your organization. Okay, that's all I have in formal presentation. And I'll be happy to answer. I see lots of craziness in the chat thing. Thank you. Yeah, we have some questions here. And there was a discussion going on for the disaster and the priority. So it was a very really productive discussion going on in parallel to your presentation. So uh, here you go. We have the first question from Mudassar Ali. How really strategic planning works in these uncertain times? And what could be the frequency of strategic meetings in uncertain times? Oh, you know, that's a great question. I, uh, that, that question should be asked every time, and I'm going to tell you the first one that's asked it. Uh, I, I think there's an important linkage between your question and what we've been talking about today. Because what we want to be able to do as project people, it's a two-way street. We want to be able to give information of of uh, project status to strategic objective people. But at the same point, if they start shifting strategy on us, we need to be able to understand what the impact is gonna be on our project. Uh, I think the strategy people, they're not, uh, they're not ignorant people I and mean, they, they understand it, but they, they don't recognize the value of maintaining that linkage. So I wanna be in a position where if strategy I can immediately identify what the impact is on my project. And, and it's going to happen that way. What we see is in, in strategic planning, uh, that's why I joked at the beginning, you know, at, at GE, we used to do one year, three year, five year. Now at GE, they do one quarter, three months. That's how fast strategy can change. So we need to be in a position where we can lead that coordination as opposed to reacting to it. Uh, thanks, Lee. Uh, there's another question from Mudassar. But why PM is worried to see what if the project is aligned with the strategy? I understand this should be the officer and PMO. What are your thoughts? Well, the PMO has to take the lead in... Uh, this is a tough question. The PMO has to take the lead in making sure that the project people have what they need to maintain that linkage. In other words, we, we provide the project people with the tools and techniques that's, that are necessary to initiate and maintain that strategic linkage. But at the same time, we need to actually have educational sessions. I know that they, they'd be very, we need to call it something fancy so it sounds like it's just for important people, but we need to have sessions with those high-level strategic people so that they understand 
the importance of maintaining that link. They need to understand the impact they have on people uh, when they just arbitrarily start to make changes on strategy. The PMO sort of oversees that. Now, I, I'm, a, I'm a kind of an interesting PMO guy. I, I think PMOs establish capabilities uh, that individuals implement. Some people see PMOs as as uh, police uh, support, as Gestapo's, where they, they tell you what to do, when to do, and how to do it. I'm not a big believer in that, but that's what IBM did. Uh, they had to, to make it happen in a, in a short period of time. So if time is your, is your challenge to implement, then uh, a, a very well-structured PMO is necessary. All right, so we have another question from Sayyid Salman Heather. Uh, what to do when every project is a priority one project? How to prioritize your priorities when everything is a priority? <laughs> well, here's, here's my, I have, a, I have a rule of thumb that I use uh, that for everything I do in the project world, I want to be able to identify two things. I want to identify the cause and the effect. So, okay, let's say we got 25, like G did, 25 priority ones. Uh, and so if I've done the linkage, I, I don't want to get away from, if I've done the vertical linkage uh, of those projects, then I want to be able to see immediately if, I'm, if I have three subject matter experts reallocated from my project to Sally's project, then I, I, I can't say to give up three of my key resources. What you've done here, here's the beauty of it, is what you've done is transfer the responsibility for prioritization right first with the decision makers. So when I say I say the cause is resource reallocation. The effect is a three-month slip in schedule. It's up to you. What do you want me to do? So I, I, I really, I'm, I love throwing it back on them. I, they can't escape decision there. We pay them big bucks to make these kinds of decisions. I, but what I've got to do is provide them the information they need to make the decision. All right, so uh, we have another question from Usman Dal. Question is communication plan and stakeholder management needs to go simultaneously when managing a project. But do you yeah, think, that's good. so but do you think when managing, uh, but do you think that the stakeholder and engagement changes as the project progresses to different stages and so does the communication plan? And in such a case, how can we cope up with the strategic importance when communication becomes more important than the strategic importance? Uh, well, first of all, let me just say, I don't know. Well, I, ca I, I can't separate the linkage of communication and strategic. So uh, to say communication becomes more important than strategy, I, I, I'm not sure I, I can uh, buy that. But here's, here's what I, I recognize is that when I create this, the communications plan comes after the stakeholder management plan, okay? So we've got the stakeholder study where we identify that stuff uh, and everything that needs to be done and to whom will we communicate in what form and format, how, how often and so on, okay? That becomes an integral part of the plan. It becomes a, an integrated document, if you will, because there's other things in the communications plan besides the stakeholder study. Uh, so, but we've got to realize that if things change on either one of those, they have to be modified. And if there's a cause and effect relationship one to the other, uh, we have to make sure that we can maintain uh, consistency with both those documents. All right, so we have another question from Usman Dal. Uh, but don't you think Agile has also comes with a few advantages, such as there are no fixed plan, which makes it harder for a PM to manage resources and schedule the project. Also, Agile requires heavy collaboration as everyone has to work together to deliver the results, including constant and quick feedback from stakeholders. 
Yeah, yeah, that's uh, we just solved a, a bunch more problems. Uh, collaboration, you know, what a what a novel idea. Uh, I see on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn a lot. I mean, I think some of you probably know that. Uh, on LinkedIn, every day, every day. Deal with the concept of leadership. Uh, how do, how can we become effective leaders? How can we how can we get more done with less? How can we uh, uh, those kinds of things? Okay, so we have to understand when we create a communications plan, for example, uh, a stakeholder uh, management plan. We, we have to identify that those needs for collaboration. Now, when we get into a situation where uh, what's going on may result in a change, th then we really have to make sure we've uh, incorporated everyone into the process that may be impacted by the change. So that collaboration needs to take place. But to, to get, here, here's my view. <clears throat> I, I personally think now don't tell don't tell PMI this because they'll they won't ask me back. I personally think if you give me an objective and a team of people, that's all I need. I'll get the project done. We'll get it done. Tell me when you want it, and I'll get it done then or earlier than that. Because what we're going to do is we're going to just collaborate the heck out of it. We're going to work on it. We're going to deal with it. Think about that project in Indiana. Uh, 205 people working 14 hours a day, seven days a week for 18 months. That's collaboration. That's, that's being able to understand what each one of us do and what we need and how we can do that kind of information. So we, we uh, and the other thing that has been brought up here, and I noticed I'll talk about it now, is that change management is, uh, change management is something you've got to really be careful with uh, because you've got to have ways of categorizing change. You can't go through a big massive formal structure on every change. It has to be a change that breaks certain thresholds uh, because change takes time and change is, is obvious. Uh, if you read Spencer Johnson's book on who moved my cheese, that, that whole book was really about it's changing so shut up and do it. Uh, so we have to realize we've got to be able to implement change, but the more we get tied down by procedures and policy, then the more we uh, have to spend time doing that instead of actually getting work done. Thanks, Lee. There's one more question from Milank. What about change management, Lee? Here I think about the change that has to happen in the organization in order to benefit free from the possibility. That might be new ways of working due to new opportunities with a new system. What is the role of a project in that dimension? Uh, well, remember we use, uh, projects are like our Petri dish for trying new things in organizations. And so we, we, uh, we end up trying things that nobody else has done before and then we see if that works and then it got, gets elevated. So when we look at this from this perspective on terms of change, I'm gonna focus on change because that was the initial question. If I've done my job well, which means I've vertically integrated and horizontally integrated uh, with the strategic objectives, then any change that is proposed will be able to be quantified in terms of impact. So we can immediately see, oh, it, it impacts my project, but oh, by the way, damn, it also impacts Sally and Bob's project. And so now we've got what looked like a simple change for my project now has multiple impacts on other projects. That's why this integration concept is so critical uh, to success with the, the total organizational approach. Okay, so we have one more question from Mudassar Ali. What could be the integration framework so that the PMs are periodically updated regarding strategy linkage to their project? Yeah, that, well, I, I would give my right arm for that document. I, I, would, I would suggest that to every senior level people I, 
uh, come in contact with. But the problem is, is this: they don't want you to see it. They, they, you know, they, there's, there's this caste, there's this caste system. Uh, and project managers aren't at the top of the caste. Uh, when we look at it, it's the CEOs at C level. They're important. They know they're important. They've got their business objectives they're managing to, and the last thing they want to do is communicate those to the lowly project manager. Uh, that's why I said you you got to sell it. You, you've got to convince them that that's you're not going to misuse that information. You're not going to abuse that information, but it's necessary for you to make sure your project's getting done in a way that supports what's important to them. All right, so there is one more question from Mudassar Ali. What do you think, who should be responsible for project economy, PM or the sponsor? Uh, project economy as a way, the way, well, the way uh, Sunil represents it, uh, I suspect uh, he thinks it's the sponsor, the one who, who's paying for the project, if you will. Uh, I'm not convinced of that personally. Uh, I think at the end of the day, just being the, the, the guy who holds the gold uh, doesn't let you create the golden rules. I, I think project managers are responsible for the project economy. If I take into context the way Sunil has presented it, he's, he's basically presented as the, it's overall the project economy, it's the projects that provide the engine to do that. Now, let me tell you about a book you might wanna get. Back in 1981, a guy named Paul Dinsmore, who works out of Rio de Janeiro, who but lives in, or is from Houston, uh, uh, created a book, authored a book called uh, organiza managing organizations by project. And so when you read that book, uh, you, start, you start thinking, well, wait a minute, this is the same thing Sunil said, but this is being said in 1981. Now, well, that's right, but the fact of the matter is, Paul was way ahead of his time, and the, the organizations weren't prepared to admit that the only thing going on in their organization that made any difference were the projects. So the book didn't sell that well. It never got adopted by organizations, but I think there's gonna be a new uh, embracing of this project economy idea. So I'm really looking forward. I'm excited about the opportunities it's going to create. All right, uh, there's one last question, Lee, which has been asked by multiple people to me, and it is, what is the strategic importance of the risk register in a project? Oh, the risk, well, you can't, I can't just isolate on the risk register, but the, on the risk management approach, it's probably one of the most uh, vital things that we do in the planning process, especially in the planning process, uh, because what we're trying to do in the risk management and the assessment of risk, potential risk, is, is to identify uh, uh, impact and probability. So wherever we see high impact but low probability, I'm not going to get excited about that. But wherever I see high impact, high probability, I, it, it may actually cause me to change my plan to build in uh, the room for contingency. In other words, I, I'm going to identify contingency, I'm going to hold it out, and if I need it, I'll incorporate it into the plan. I, I think it's, that's why I, it's in my top three. I mean, there's so many things it could be, but risk management is in my top three, and I got to have the first two, the WBS and the critical path, in order to use the risk management effectively. All right, thank you, Lee. I think this was the last question I received. So uh, I think there were not 97 questions, Lee, which you were referring earlier. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you everyone right uh, for joining us